Hello and a very warm welcome back to another episode in the cancelled game series. Now this is a new one for me because I'm revisiting a system we've already covered, the Dreamcast. This was the very first episode of cancelled games I ever did, way back in August 2017. Since then a lot has changed, many new games have popped up and some new footage for some of the games that I previously covered. And a lot has changed with my production value too, jeez. The original episode had 15 games, this one has a whopping 33 unreleased Dreamcast games and that's still not all of them. Let's have a look. DD Planet was a planned second entry in Sega's Easy Network series of games for the Dreamcast, the first being Choo Choo Rocket, and it's definitely got that same quirkiness. This was an artillery game much like the early artillery games which influenced Worms, like Scorched Earth and Tanks. Developed by Dory Dock, it would be published by Sega exclusively on the Dreamcast. Being an easy network game, DD Planet would make use of the Dreamcast modem to allow players to battle it out online. Matches are fought with four robots, be them player controlled or computer AI. The gameplay is in essence very simple, just aim your missiles using the arrow above your character and fire. Like the early artillery games, the physics are simple, just set the desired degree to aim and fire with the correct power. If you get both of these elements correct, you'll hit your target. The stages are called zones, each having unique terrain. There's gel zone, block zone and liquid zone, with each having terrain befitting its name. If a missile misses its target, it will hit the terrain and destroy a portion of it, permanently changing the landscape, much like the destructible environments in Worms. The zones aren't merely different in appearance, they also have different physics, for example the gravity will vary in intensity. This means that the physics of shooting missiles will be slightly different in each zone and players must adjust accordingly. Stylistically, it's influenced by early 80s arcade games. Other factors affect the gameplay too, each character has unique abilities, the stages feature random events and items, and there's even a shop where you can buy extra weaponry and upgrades using points scored. Initially planned for an August 2001 release in Japan, DD Planet's release date came and went due to apparent networking bugs, and for an online game, networking bugs are really a death sentence. Despite this, the servers were revived in September of 2022, so you can actually play this online now. Gorka Morka was a post-apocalyptic vehicular combat game being developed by Real Sports for the Dreamcast and Windows to be published by Ripcord based on the tabletop Warhammer game. The tabletop game was originally released in 1997. A tabletop skirmish war game produced by Games Workshop, it's set on the desert world of Angelus in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. The video game as with the tabletop prominently features orcs. The idea was to win races but also heavily focused on combat. Each vehicle would have a driver and a gunner which could be controlled independently in co-op. In single player, the player would switch between controlling the driver and the gunner during the races. The idea was that deciding when to switch would be a tactical decision with the player deciding whether to prioritize accurate driving or well-targeted shooting between sections of the race. Of course, in multiplayer, the best of both could be implemented. Details on the game's planned multiplayer vary, with various sources citing different numbers. It would either support 8 cars in multiplayer and therefore 16 players, or 16 cars with 32 players total. This switching of positions becomes particularly necessary with the tracks, traps and shortcuts, because traps can only be triggered by a player controlled gunner, and similarly shortcuts can only be taken if the driver is player controlled. The aim was to upgrade your co-pilot's abilities and your vehicle's weaponry after each race, using money earned through damaging rival vehicles and winning races. This meant that your AI co-pilot could actually improve at driving and gunning. Money earned would also need to be spent on repairing damage incurred to your own vehicle. The money was actually teeth, which apparently orcs use for currency. Races weren't won by placing first, as the races would run for a set amount of time rather than a set number of laps. The winner would be the one who had dealt the most damage to opponents during the race. Also, specific parts of enemy vehicles could be targeted for destruction. The better a racer did, the more fans he would gain, leading to larger crowds cheering you on in the stands. Gorka Morka was developed between 1999 and 2001, featured at E3 in 2000, and had a planned release date for October 2001. 
It was cancelled in March 2001 due to the Dreamcast's discontinuation. An early build of the PC version from January 2001 can be found online. Half-Life is one I actually own a reproduction physical copy of on the Dreamcast. This combines Half-Life and Half-Life Blue Shift, both of which were planned for the Dreamcast and were actually developed. Announced in early 2000, this port of Valve's groundbreaking first-person shooter was developed by Gearbox Software and Captivation Digital Laboratories, the latter handling the hardware side of porting the game. Gearbox's job was new content, which came in the form of the Blue Shift expansion pack, which was originally created as a Dreamcast exclusive. This port was quite ambitious and even featured an online multiplayer mode. Having played it, I can say that it really needs the mouse and keyboard peripherals for the Dreamcast as it plays absolutely terribly with a controller. The frame rate isn't great and the load times, oh the load times are an absolute killer. It seems that critics thought the same, as this was a common gripe amongst press who received early copies of the game. It was eventually cancelled only weeks prior to its planned release date in June 2001, although it had been pushed back a few times by that point. The situation with the Dreamcast was blamed, but obviously the poor frame rate and horrendous load times didn't help matters. Their efforts weren't entirely wasted though, as they decided to release Blue Shift on PC as a standalone expansion in June 2001. 1991's Battle Mania and its 1993 sequel Battle Mania Dai Ginjo are up there with the most fun shooters on the Mega Drive in my opinion. The sequel never left Japan, but North America got the first one under the name Troubleshooter. Unlucky for us in Europe. This series is about as Japanese as it gets, scrolling shooter action, anime inspired female main characters, and just awesome graphics and sound. Well, a third entry in the series was planned for the Dreamcast. Unfortunately, all we have are some concept art drawings. This threequel would be called Battle Mania 3 NY, Gankutsujo, which Google Translate tells me means above the rock cave, but that doesn't sound right, so God knows. The NY bit stands for New York, where the game would be set, with the game's two heroines travelling there from Japan for this entry in the series. It was being developed by Takayan, along with some developers from Vic Tokai, who programmed the originals on the Mega Drive. We can see from mock-ups that the Dreamcast iteration would move to 3D, with the gameplay perspective being behind the characters like Space Harrier. This seems fitting for the Dreamcast, which did this with other shooters, the Cotton series being a great example, which moved to 3D on the Dreamcast with Rainbow Cotton. This looks like the exact perspective Battle Mania 3 would have gone for. The drawings also feature classic Japanese cultural icons like a giant robot, and one depicts what looks like a versus fighter mode with mechs. Ultimately, they couldn't find an interested publisher, and Battle Mania 3 was scrapped. Castlevania Resurrection was a planned Dreamcast entry in Konami's popular series. This would have been the third 3D Castlevania game after Castlevania and Castlevania Legacy of Darkness on the N64, the latter technically being an expanded remake of the former. This Dreamcast entry would be set in 1666, sitting on the timeline between the two NES originals, Castlevania 2 set in 1591 and Castlevania set 100 years later in 1691. Resurrection's story would revolve around Sonya Belmont, a character in the Belmont clan first introduced in Castlevania Legends on the Game Boy in 1997. She was born with the ability to sense spirits that are otherwise undetectable by normal humans. Legends was set in 1450 when Sonya was 17 years old. Obviously Resurrection being set in 1666 means she would be 133, but this is explained by the game's premise. In the year 1666, around the time when the Countess resurrected Count Dracula via a portal, an unknown force resurrects Sonya Belmont from her grave. Along with her descendant from the future, Victor, Sonya must set forth to the castle Dracula once again. So that explains the game's title, Resurrection. The gameplay is exactly what you'd expect from a 3D third person platforming adventure game from this era, with Sonya running and leaping her way through the castle with her trusty whip and spells in tow. When I originally covered this, only screenshots existed online. In recent years, a playable pre-E3 demo of Castlevania Resurrection has emerged from late 1999, which features five stages and a boss fight with Medusa. 
Resurrection was cancelled in March 2000, allegedly due to disagreements between Konami's North American and Japanese divisions. At least it's seen a resurrection of sorts with this demo emerging. There are many Sega arcade games that never saw a console release back in the day, particularly racing games, and Scud Race was one of the most wanted. It's criminal that this was never released on a Sega console. Scud Race was developed by AM2 for Sega's Model 3 arcade hardware, and was released as Sega Super GT in North America. Despite hitting arcades in 1996, it didn't get a Saturn release, but it was included in the Dreamcast's 1998 pre-launch lineup with a tech demo being shown. And the Dreamcast would have been easily capable of running Scud Race, having a processor three times the speed of the arcade hardware and more RAM. And this is exactly where the Dreamcast shined, with arcade quality Sega arcade ports in the home. Ah, what could have been. Many will know Dragon's Crown, Vanillaware's 2D action RPG on the PS3 and Vita and later the PS4, but not many know that it was originally intended for release on the Dreamcast. A sequel to the Japan-only Princess Crown on the Saturn, Dragon's Crown was conceived in 1998 by Vanillaware president George Kamitani, but he couldn't find a publisher willing to bring the project to the Dreamcast. I originally suspected that this may have been due to the difficulty in finding publishers for 2D games during that era, but rumour has it that the original Dragon's Crown concept would have been 3D. When Dragon's Crown finally saw release 15 years later in 2013, the game's art book contained a piece of concept art from the Dreamcast version, but that's all that exists. Worms and Rally Fever Pinball was a planned Dreamcast port of Addiction Pinball, which Team 17 released on Windows in 1998, and was ported to the PlayStation in 1999 as Worms Pinball. Addiction Pinball contains two tables, one for Worms and one for Rally Fever, two of Team 17's franchises. Obviously, the PlayStation port was renamed to Worms Pinball to capitalise on the huge success of Worms, and the Dreamcast port would follow suit. Rumour has it that the original concept for Addiction Pinball would include a third table based on another popular Team 17 franchise from the Amiga, Alien Breed. Seemingly, the Dreamcast port was all but completed, and a playable demo exists dated late 2000. Another post-apocalyptic vehicular combat game here, Redline Arena or Redline 2, was a planned sequel to the original Redline, released on Windows in 1999 also known as Redline Gang Warfare 2066 in Europe. Developed by Beyond Games, they created a playable prototype of Redline Arena based on an updated port of the original game. Redline and its planned sequel are part car combat racer and part first person shooter, allowing the player to exit their vehicle and use guns. The Dreamcast sequel would also feature online multiplayer. Eventually development moved to the PlayStation 2 and the project later morphed into Motor Mayhem which started life using the same engine. D-Jump was an action platformer being developed by Ubisoft during 1997 and 1998 and was intended for release on the Dreamcast, the PlayStation 2 on which it would be a launch title and PC. It was cancelled a year and a half into the development process, but I'm not sure why. D-Jump starred an athletic raster and blended action and platforming elements with a plot based around time travel. The concept art depicts the protagonist engaging in various athletic activities and sports, including surfing and water skiing, as well as running, climbing and jumping. The game spans several time periods, as is evident from the concept art, especially what seems to be ancient Egypt, with the player trying to discover why the main character is slowly turning into wood. There doesn't seem to be much information available for a game that was so far on in development, but quite an interesting one judging by the concept art alone. The art style rather reminds me of Little Big Adventure. Quark was an action-adventure game being developed around 2000 by Quantic Dream, David Cage's studio behind Fahrenheit and Heavy Rain. This seems to be quite the departure from their usual style, which is cinematic action-adventure games that play more like interactive films with a heavy focus on quick-time events. Quark was said to be an adventure in the spirit of the 3D Zelda games involving exploration, combat and puzzle solving, a fantasy adventure game with RPG elements. 
The story was set in two universes, with the player controlling two siblings, Wacky and Una, who are beings called travellers who have the ability to travel between universes. Their aim is to prevent a former traveller gone bad, abetted by an army of creatures from another dimension, from destroying the two worlds. Una's universe appears to be set in London around the Victorian era, while Wacky's is set in Quark's fantasy world. The siblings have the help of various creatures, with different animals having unique powers to aid in combat or puzzle solving, and each animal will control differently, with the player actually controlling the animal's movement and so on. While Una's animals are animals you'd expect to find on Earth, like a dog and monkey, Wacky's would be alien creatures indigenous to the fantasy world. The game promised a complex interwoven story wherein the events of one universe would affect the other. David Cage said, the whole game is about crossovers, the two worlds are linked, some sets or characters look similar in both worlds, so solving puzzles in one world may open up opportunities in another. In another bizarre twist, the siblings would not be fully aware of each other's existence, only aware of each other through dreams, which is also how they communicate. Magazine previews stated a late 2000 release, but Quark simply disappeared. A shame, as this project is quite fascinating. Take the Bullet, developed by Red Lemon Studios, was to be a light gun game for the Dreamcast, with a secondary third person view and both online and local multiplayer modes. What differentiated it from other Dreamcast light gun games was that your weapon appeared on screen, much like it would in a first person shooter. Set in 60s America, Take the Bullet sees the player assume the role of a bodyguard, tasked with protecting a presidential candidate from a gang of thugs and must also coordinate with the other members of the bodyguard team to do so successfully. As well as single player campaign, Take the Bullet would also support 4 player split screen multiplayer, which is quite unique for a light gun game. Using a light gun was optional of course, the player could use a controller and play it as a normal first person shooter. Initially planned for a European release during Christmas 99, the game was delayed and in the end never emerged. Smurfs was being developed for the Dreamcast and PS2 by Appaloosa Interactive, a Hungarian studio who were no strangers to developing games for Sega consoles, having developed numerous games for the Game Gear, Mega Drive and Saturn, most notably the Echo the Dolphin games. It resembles a 3D open world platform game, but would have gameplay elements in common with Pikmin. The available footage uploaded by an Appaloosa employee shows the player controlling Papa Smurf as he's followed by other Smurfs. It appears the aim is to rescue all the smurfs on the level, and there are also toadstools to collect, although it's unclear if they do anything beyond being a mere collectible. Papa Smurf solves various puzzles along the way to access previously unpassable areas and obstacles, and ensure the smurfs get rescued safely. The footage makes one think that the game was quite far along, as it looks pretty good and has a fully realised engine, but it was only about 30% developed when it was cancelled. Even so, at least a few levels were fully playable. The reasons for its cancellation aren't known, but speculation suggests it either died when publisher Infograms was absorbed by Atari, or they never had the Smurfs license to begin with. Metal Max is a series of strategy RPGs that started life on the Famicom in 1991, developed by Createch and published by Data East. The first game was released exclusively in Japan was one of the first open world games on the console. Metal Max clearly drew inspiration from Mad Max being set in a bleak post-apocalyptic world. Max took on jobs as a bounty hunter, chasing down monsters and criminals across the wasteland. Money earned could be used to upgrade Max's vehicles and weaponry. Its gameplay featured open world exploration of a huge world inhabited by interesting characters, but the combat was turn based. It offered an open-ended mission structure, and the game had multiple endings. Metal Max moved on to the Super Famicom, again only in Japan. After this, Metal Max moved to 3D. A Dreamcast entry was announced at the 1999 Tokyo Game Show, initially called Metal Max Overdrive, which would later be renamed Metal Max Wild Eyes. Very little exists on the project, but the small amount of available footage shows it would likely be more of the same in three dimensions, open world exploration with turn-based combat. Interestingly, a Japanese promo clip shows Data East in the accompanying text, but Wild Eyes was to be published by ASCII. ASCII decided to cease releasing console games and it was cancelled, 
that the Metal Max series lived on. Its first 3D game that actually saw release was Metal Saga, released on the PS2 in 2005. The series has gone on to have several releases on consoles including the DS, 3DS, PS4 and Vita. The 2018 PS4 and Vita release Metal Max Xeno is said to have been based on the cancelled Wild Eyes game on the Dreamcast. Gunby is a game that was cancelled for both the arcade and for the Dreamcast. Treasure conceived the idea when the Naomi was announced, and it would have been their second arcade game after 1998's Radiant Silver Gun. The list of Naomi arcade games ported to Dreamcast is huge because the hardware made it far easier to create arcade perfect ports. Gunbeat was a racing game of sorts, their first fully 3D game, was partly inspired by wacky races and saw up to four players racing atop vehicles or creatures around the track filled with hazards and enemies. There were four selectable characters, Carmine who races on a hoverbike, Mirabelle on a broomstick, Kunyanya riding a giant flying squirrel, and Squadman who is himself a vehicle as he's a giant robot that can run and fly. It sounds insane and insanely fun. The racing element is built upon with the addition of action and shooting elements so your character can fire projectiles which can slow down the opponents and also destroy the course's hazards and enemies. Each of the four characters would have their own special shot type. As with many of Treasure's games, scoring played a major part, with some huge boss-like enemies awarding bonus points if defeated, and the player can chain combos together to boost their score. The available footage doesn't give much away as it's shockingly poor, and there are very few screenshots as well. It seems that the game was tested, featured in magazines, and was shown in a video-only form by Sega at Japanese Expo AOU in 1999, who were showcasing games for their new Naomi hardware. Interestingly, the other three games shown, Crazy Taxi, F355 Challenge and Zombie Revenge were all ported to Dreamcast. Seeing as the Dreamcast hardware was almost identical to that of the Naomi, a port would have been a slam dunk had the arcade game been released. Gumbeat got a warm reception at the show, receiving praise for its speed, looks and signature treasure quirkiness. It's thought that it was cancelled when the project lead left the company, who Treasure were unwilling to replace due to their displeasure with the game's progress, so development was halted in May of 2000. X-Fighters is an unusual entry here because all we have is this one image of three of the proposed characters, but I think it's interesting because of their designs. X-Fighters was a 3D fighter from Midway San Diego, said to have gameplay elements in common with Capcom's Power Stone. Nothing is known about this game, and Midway didn't even announce it, but the characters look so similar in design to Ready to Rumble Boxing's characters that it's likely that Midway switched development to a boxing game using the same style. X-Fighters was conceived in 1998, a year prior to Ready to Rumble's release on the Dreamcast. The characters would include a mad scientist and female space cop, so it looks like it would have been quite wacky. Skies was an MMO set in a fantasy world of flying creatures including aliens, dragons and vampires. It was described as state of the art flight simulation technology in a 3D universe allowing the player to interact with thousands of other online users. Only a few screenshots to go on here. It was developed by Paradigm Entertainment but the concept and publishing were by Segasoft. Paradigm developed Pilotwing 64 and there are certainly some similarities. Initially a PC exclusive, it was announced that Skies was coming to Dreamcast although the port never emerged. In early 2000, Rockstar announced a Dreamcast exclusive kart racer called Austin Powers Mojo Rally. It was being developed by UK based Climax Studios to be released in November 2000. With the three films in the Austin Powers franchise being released in 1997, 1999 and 2002, this was right at the height of its popularity, but Austin Powers seems to have been sorely underrepresented in video games. There was a PlayStation pinball game, and a duo of games on the Game Boy Color which were coincidentally published by Rockstar, but that's it I think. Sadly, all that exists are a few screenshots of the characters and their respective vehicles, but we can assume that the gameplay would be much like other kart races. It would have weaponry to suit the different characters, and would feature 15 tracks based on the locations from the films like Dr. Evil's Lair and London in the 60s. 
One proposed gameplay mechanic which sounds really cool is a time travel aspect, whereby racers could activate time portals and travel through them. The racers would also have a mojo meter to fill, which would grant a speed and handling boost. It would of course allow for 4 players split screen multiplayer, allegedly at 60 frames per second. Why was this cancelled? Who knows? Various reasons have been suggested, including the oversaturation of kart races and the like during that time. Geist Force was a planned launch title for the Dreamcast and looks really interesting. It looks awesome from its Star Fox-esque gameplay and graphics to its striking cutscenes which were made by the special effects company that worked on Babylon 5. Sadly this was all costing a great deal and the game ended up being rather short and dull despite its fancy presentation. The game was delayed so as not to release a game that wasn't fully realised as a launch title, first impressions of a new console being very important, but further development would have cost more money than a flailing Sega were willing to spend. As a result, Geist Force was cancelled. A copy of the prototype was obtained by Assembler Games after a fundraiser and was released online so you can play Geist Force on your Dreamcast. Just don't expect a fully polished experience, but it's still worth playing to see what could have been. A real shame in my opinion as this game looks like it would have been excellent with a bit of tweaking. When the Dreamcast was discontinued so early on in its life, many of its games were cancelled too, but a number of those cancelled Dreamcast games ended up moving to the Xbox, often dubbed the Dreamcast 2 by fans. This is due to the similarities between the two consoles, with Microsoft likely taking inspiration from Sega's final console, and the Dreamcast used Microsoft products like Windows CE and DirectX. There were even talks to allow backwards compatibility with Dreamcast discs, but after talks with Sega that didn't pan out. Still, it made it ideal for porting Dreamcast games. The Dreamcast was discontinued in March of 2001, and the Xbox hit North American shelves in November that year. Although the Dreamcast saw new releases way past its discontinuation in Japan up until 2007, Western Dreamcast owners stopped getting new games in early 2002. A lot of well-loved Dreamcast franchises headed over to Microsoft's new console, Jet Set Radio or Jet Grind Radio if you're in North America, Crazy Taxi, Sonic, Panzer Dragoon, House of the Dead. One of the most well-known cases and one that actually has a fully playable prototype on the Dreamcast is Toejam & L3 Mission to Earth. This was released on the Xbox in late 2002, after the Dreamcast has stopped getting games in the West. A sequel to the first two installments on the Mega Drive, this third game was the first release in the series not to appear on a Sega console, and also its first foray into 3D. Seemingly the large gap between the second and third games of almost nine years since December 1993 was due to disagreements between Sega and the franchise creators, Mark Vorsanger and Greg Johnson. In this threequel, the funky aliens are back on Earth, and the gameplay is essentially a 3D version of the platforming exploration of the original. The game was originally planned for the N64, but the development moved to the Dreamcast. It was developed to a great extent, and then moved over to Xbox once the console had been killed off. Mark and Greg had expressed that they would have preferred development to shift to PS2 or GameCube, but at the end of the day, Xbox architecture allowed for a much easier transition, which is likely why the Dreamcast and Xbox versions are so similar. The Dreamcast version was discovered on a dev kit in 2013, and Toe creators agreed to publicly distribute the prototype online in 2018. Another cancelled Dreamcast game being developed by Hungarian studio Appaloosa was Echo the Dolphin 2 Sentinels of the Universe. As I mentioned earlier, the Echo series is what they're most known for. Sentinels of the Universe was a planned sequel to Defender of the Future, released on Dreamcast in 2000 and later the PlayStation 2. Very little was known about this game until a playable beta was found in a Dreamcast dev kit and was released online. This is another one that I own as a reproduction and it's perfectly playable but very unfinished. You can get an idea of the game from this prototype version and hey, it's a 3D Echo game so I'm sure you can imagine. As I said, many Dreamcast franchises moved over to the Xbox after its death. One studio that was responsible for this migration was Smilebit, a first party developer at Sega who developed Panzer Dragoon Auto and Jet Set Radio Future for the Xbox. Panzer Dragoon Auto was actually originally pitched for the Dreamcast. 
Well, they were also developing another game for the Dreamcast, Gun Valkyrie, which made its way to the Xbox after being cancelled. Gun Valkyrie is a third person shooter, but we can clearly see a little hint of Panzer Dragoon in here. Set in a fictional future where humans have inhabited several planets, the player is tasked with exterminating giant insects which have infested the colonies. Its original Dreamcast version planned to use a dual controller setup, where the player would use a controller and a light gun in tandem. Sounds very tricky and downright terrible to boot. Thankfully they scrapped that idea when the project moved over to the Xbox on which it was released in early 2000. But even then the game was criticised for its complicated control scheme which involved the rather fiddly use of both analogue sticks, making the controls quite hard to master. Still, probably easier than holding a chunky Dreamcast controller and a light gun. The promo footage available of the Dreamcast version shows that it seems to be quite similar to the final game on Xbox. Hellgate was in development for 15 months before cancellation, developed by Horny Dog with Jester Interactive handling the publishing. The game was said to be a cross between Quake and Wipeout, blending third person shooter gameplay with that of an arcade racer. The player was to race through levels on a hovering motorbike while using a variety of weapons to slay demons. Both local and online multiplayer modes were planned. Hellgate was eventually cancelled, partly due to the Dreamcast's demise and partly due to rumoured disinterest with the product among certain staff members. In 2009 a beta was leaked, so you can actually try it for yourself on your Dreamcast. Seemingly Sega of Japan had planned to bring the Streets of Rage franchise to the Dreamcast since early on in the console's life in the form of Streets of Rage 4. A tech demo eventually appeared online showing the game's planned 3D graphics and even a first person viewpoint, and rumour has it that various new features were planned such as team attacks. The reason the game never materialised was due to Sega of America allegedly being unfamiliar with the series and its popularity. I don't know whether or not this is true, but I find it insane that anyone at Sega could be unaware of one of the company's most beloved franchises. Whatever the reason, I'd take comfort in the fact that this game never saw release. When I did my last Council Games video back in 2017, we hadn't seen a fourth entry in the series. In fact, no entry in the series since 3 in 1994. Now we've had a Streets of Rage 4 released in 2020, which thankfully was 2D, something that I expressed hope for in the original video, so that's nice to see. Obviously someone at Sega was aware of it after all. Agatha, an interesting looking horror adventure, began development as early as 1998 with a planned 1999 release. Eventually this was pushed back before it was ultimately cancelled. Is it Agatha or Agatha? I'm still not sure how to pronounce this. It was being developed by No Cliché, a French studio set up by Sega in 1997. They developed two Dreamcast games, Toy Commander and Toy Racer, so a survival horror would seem like quite the departure. But perhaps not once you consider the man in charge, Frederick Reinal, who had experience with the genre having been the designer on Alone in the Dark. As a side note, he also created Little Big Adventure, which I love. So we can imagine that this game would have had at least a little in common with Alone in the Dark. Set in a Romanian village in 1929 under which the subterranean city of Agatha imprisons evil with evil desperate to escape. An earthquake opens up the barrier between them. The story follows main character Kirk as he explores the snow covered village, encountering demons, zombies and all manner of evil that has erupted from the newly opened ground. Gameplay was to combine action with puzzle solving elements. The player's moral choices were to affect the storyline, as Kirk would choose whether to save the village's population or to side with the evil. It seems that these moral choices would push the limits of the subjects of ethics and morality in video games, and the team have since expressed the view that they experienced heavy censorship during its development. The aim was to create the definitive survival horror on the Dreamcast, surpassing even Resident Evil. They wanted the player to experience fear not only at the zombies and evil, but fear of their own capabilities, fear of their inner evil, if you will, being disturbed by their own in-game choices. When I originally covered Council Dreamcast games years ago, all that was available to this game was concept art, but even that was enough to pique my interest. Since then, a playable prototype was discovered in 2018 and has been dumped online. 
Agartha was cancelled in 2001 when the Dreamcast was discontinued, which also resulted in Sega disbanding, no cliche. Glover 2 was a planned sequel to Glover, a 3D platformer for the PlayStation N64 and PC, in which the protagonist is an anthropomorphic glove. The game was cancelled when it was 80-85% complete, apparently due to some miscalculations made during the manufacture of its predecessor. A Hasbro employee severely overestimated the number of N64 carts that would be needed for the original Glover, ordering the production of 300,000 carts double the usual expected sales for a third party N64 game of 150,000 units. So despite Glover selling well, Hasbro were left with around 150,000 carts that they couldn't shift, equating to around half a million dollars. The name Glover became associated with this terrible situation, and so Glover 2 never saw the light of day. A prototype of the N64 version of Glover 2 was discovered a while back, which is the footage you've been seeing on screen. Propeller Arena is another one that I have a physical reproduction of, and probably the one most worth playing in my opinion. Full title Propeller Arena Aviation Battle Championship, it was developed by Sega's renowned AM2, and was due for release in November 2001. Set in the future, the game involves planes from World War II participating in dogfights. With several multiplayer modes and a focus on online play, Propeller Arena really showed off the Dreamcast's capabilities, as to be expected with AM2 being behind the wheel. Or behind the joystick, I suppose. Sadly, the timing couldn't have been worse. As I mentioned, Propeller Arena was due for release in November of 2001, just weeks after the tragic events of 9-11. As the game contained planes, and one level in particular in which those planes would crash into tall buildings, the game was postponed so as not to be deemed in poor taste. As the Dreamcast was on the way out anyway, the game never actually saw release. This is criminal as Propeller Arena was entirely finished, and it's bloody good fun too. You can download the game to play yourself. A sequel to 1992's Chakan the Forever Man on the Mega Drive was planned for the Dreamcast, being developed by the original game's creator Ed Annunziata, who is perhaps most famous for creating the Echo the Dolphin games. The original game was based on the comic book of the same name. The story sees Chakan, a warrior and gifted swordsman, give it the big one, declaring not even Death himself can beat him. Death says okay, and turns up to challenge him. Death promises Chakan eternal life if he's the victor. Well, Chakan does indeed defeat Death, earning himself immortality, but Death also curses him. He must roam the earth until all supernatural evil has been eradicated. At some point, probably early on, the Dreamcast sequel is scrapped, and all that remains is a character tech demo and some concept art. Some of the assets were subsequently used in Blood Omen 2, the fourth game in the Legacy of Kane series, which came to the other six generation consoles, on which Ed was lead artist. Picasso was a planned Dreamcast stealth game in which you would play as an art thief, being developed by Norwich based Promethean Designs. All that exists is a very poor quality video, a few screenshots, and a storyboard which seems very James Bond. The idea was to steal artwork as part of a bet with another thief. The thief would have access to over 20 gadgets, including night vision goggles, a stun gun, crossbow, and his trusty chloroform rag. Not sure what the crossbow was for, but it certainly wasn't to shoot people, as the video states Picasso is a non-violent game. If you don't count violently choking out people using chloroform, that is. Picasso underwent several concept changes during its long development, including the pivot to a more adventure game style after the studio head saw Shenmue, and also at some point the protagonist changed from male to female. Eventually, development moved from the Dreamcast to the PS2 and GameCube, but Promethean Designs ran into money troubles and went bust. A video made in 2000 emerged on the internet which showed an intro sequence for Thunder Force 6 on the Dreamcast, suggesting that it was at one point in development. The band Noise released an album called Broken Thunder in 2001, which featured music that would have been on the Thunder Force 6 soundtrack. Composer and Noise band member Tsukumo Hyakutaro had composed music for several of Technosoft's previous games. 
I'm not sure whether Thunder Force 6 was planned as a Japanese exclusive or whether it would have made it to Western shores, and I have no idea why it never saw release, but Technosoft's last release was in 1998, and they haven't been active in the industry since the early 2000s. Thunder Force 6 later released on the PS2 in Japan in 2008 by Sega, the last in the series, and the only entry not made by Technosoft. Shrapnel Urban Warfare 2025 was originally titled MOUT 2025, which stood for Military Operations in Urban Terrain. It was a squad-based first-person shooter being developed by Zombie Studios for the Dreamcast and PC during the Dreamcast's short lifetime, and would be published by Ripcord Games. Shrapnel would be a futuristic twist on the Spec Ops series of games which Zombie also developed. The theme was counter-terrorism, and was set in the very near future, hence the 2025. Magazine previews liken the gameplay to Spec Ops, Omega Squad and Rainbow Six. The developers promised various multiplayer modes including online deathmatch for up to 8 players, as well as revolutionary AI. The main story would see American cities being overrun by terrorists, and it's your team's job to stop them. Apparently the design and AI were being developed with the assistance of real-world counter-terrorism experts to ensure realism. Zombie games were well known for realism anyway, they were commissioned by the US Armed Forces to create training simulations. As it was set in 2025, the weaponry was based on real world tech, but with a bit of an advanced twist. Each squad member would sport a helmet with integrated digital heads up display, and could use advanced weaponry like smart grenades. The setting was quite sci-fi too, with the cities featuring huge Japanese style digital billboards. Despite the futuristic lean, Shrapnel would strive for realism, so damage taken by enemies and squad members would be unusually realistic, so headshots would kill instantly for example. In March of 2001 after it became clear Sega were going to abandon the Dreamcast, Ripcord decided to axe any Dreamcast games they were planning to publish. This included the aforementioned Gorkamorka and of course Shrapnel. In April that year they closed their doors altogether. The original Armada was a North American exclusive release on the Dreamcast, developed and published by Metro 3D. A Japanese release was planned, but for some reason never happened. A space shooter slash RPG supporting 1-4 players, it allowed players to explore space, killing enemies and completing missions. Credits earned could be used to improve your ship. A sequel was planned called Armada 2 Exodus, which would feature more of the same, but would focus more on online multiplayer. Initially being developed for the Dreamcast, development shifted to the Xbox, GameCube and possibly PS2. During this time it suffered several delays and redesigns, eventually being cancelled. In 2005, some former Metro 3D employees bought the rights to Armada and released a game called Armada Online, which ran for many years. The Flintstones in Viva Rock Vegas was a planned Dreamcast game based on the 2000 film. Being developed by Full Fat and published by Swing Entertainment, it was to be a kart racer. The player would race one of several Stone Age vehicles across several courses based on locations from the film. The settings and characters would primarily be based on the film, but the cartoony visuals are more reminiscent of the Hanna-Barbera cartoon. To be honest, I think the cartoon would have been better source material, as this film came and went without any lasting impact. It made a loss at the box office, and I don't even remember it coming out. Tracks are littered with bowling pins which award an item if knocked down. These are themed versions of the usual kart racer pickups, a paint can in place of an oil slick, a bowling ball as a projectile and so on. There are also tokens along the tracks which fill up this meter at the bottom right with the great gazoo icon. Once all five slots are filled, the player can perform a boost. Above the player's car is an arrow telling you which way to go, kind of like Crazy Taxi, which can be useful as it's not always obvious. The aim of the game is to take part in the Boulder Ball Run race in order to win gems. The player can then put these gems into a ring to present to Wilma in order to woo her. If successful, Wilma will agree to marry the player. A white label prototype was made of this Dreamcast version with a rumoured print run of only 12 discs. It's unclear how finished it was meant to be as it doesn't feel quite done, but was obviously far enough along to warrant a white label. Eventually, another kart racer based on the film Viva Rock Vegas was released on PlayStation 2 in 2002. Although also a kart racer, it's visually very different to the Dreamcast version and was made by a different studio.
So that was 33 of the many cancelled Dreamcast games. Sometimes it was for the best, but often it was a great shame that some of these games never saw release. The early demise of the system certainly didn't help, although in recent years the console has seen a new lease of life with all the indie developers releasing games on it. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments if any of these tickle your fancy. Thanks for watching. You can find the rest of my cancelled games series in this playlist.